Hello everybody, this is Bella Jade Michaels and I'm meeting a wonderful friend here today, Brian. You want to say hello? Hello. And Brian is the founder and creator of Sky Realm Films. Is that correct Correct, or is this productions? That's Sky Realm Films. Sky Realm Films. And this is brand new. Yep. And so you're super excited because you're really, you're able to do your passion now. A lot of us are confronted with that issue right now. We really love what we do, but... Um, having the opportunity to actually make a go out of it and uh, uh, really do something amazing is, that's what we all want to be doing, so. Absolutely, you know, and, and um, I do work a regular job on, on top of what I do with, with Sky Realm Films, but, you know, I find it very hard to kind of juggle between both, so. Um, <clears throat> But we didn't come here today to no, talk right. about that. Absolutely not. Uh, thank you for having <laughs> but, me, by the way. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, I do a lot of things just talking one-on-one -on -one to to the people out there, but I always like connecting with others, um, especially when we're talking about really deep subjects. Um, I love to get input from other people as well. So I knew today that, um, well, let me just say, I have been letting my friends know that I've been completely consumed with Eckhart Tolle's uh, A New Earth, which is not actually a new book. I think it's been out for several years now. And um, I felt like I had a calling, you know what I'm saying? I had a calling to like just investigate his work again, come back to it. And um, so far, I know you have also been... I've been listening to it as well, um, you know, based upon your recommendation through your social media channels and, and things like that. And uh, there was there's really a spot that I heard, I believe it was in Chapter 5 of his book. Uh, I'm listening to it via audio on mm -hmm. YouTube, which you can find it. It's a, you know, yeah. just type that's in a, a new earth a with Eckhart Great. Tolle. It's like nine hours long, but... Great. You know, you get the whole book in an audio format. Um, I believe it was in chapter five, and he was talking about the pain body. Yeah. And where... But first, let's tell people what that is. I mean, in case they don't really understand what a pain body is, because we know what our physical body is. And most people know what their spiritual body or their soul body is. But when you talk about a pain body, we generally get confused. Some people have an idea of what the ego is. And I think what we would like to do is to let people know that the ego and the pain body kind of bounce off of each other, kind of are uh, somewhat intermingled or, or, or um, entangled with each other. Mm -hmm. So that you can't have one without the other. You have a, a mind dominated with ego reactive, highly reactive stuff. Your pain body is obviously going to be very large because majority of what you're reciprocating, what you're receiving even is negative. So... So, like, your pain body would be, like, as you're describing, can, would be, like, the ego. The ego's rendition of pain body. It's a creation of the of, of the ego. You know, the ego in itself is kind of the falling of man. I mean, if you really want to think about it this way. Um, we come into this world whole, but due to the conditions and circumstances by which we're raised... And for the majority, for millennia, it's been very unconscious, it's been very warlike, um, very bullish, uh, that kind of thing. We quickly unravel and, you know, our minds don't know how to assimilate this. They either fall into love if you have fully conscious parents, or it's pretty much a disaster case, okay? And children become afraid. Uh, for the first time, even being born is a big deal. Being in a warm womb where, womb where everything is uh, given to you and then mm -hmm. coming out and being cold all of a sudden, uh, the lights are shocking, the sounds are very strange. I mean, we know fear right away. Right. Um, so our, our pain body is activated in the moment that we take our first breath. So there's no way to unravel it. It's part of that suffering. And and you bring out and you and you bring up a good point. You know, our, our pain body starts off right in the moment. And and one of the great things that Eckhart said in that particular part of his in that, that chapter, um, the only way out of your pain body is to be present in the moment. Mm. Um, How hard is that? Pretty darn hard. Let me tell for you. Most people, it's pretty hard. No, no really. You for, know, because I mean, do you catch yourself even being in your work. I have a hard time catching myself, you know, I mean, you know, I understand the concept of pain body, I understand that, 
you know, I mean, I'm on a journey to consciousness myself, so I understand pain body. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it fully, but... Well, that's because it's remaining in <clears throat> its conceptual form. Once right. it comes out of that, it will be, that will be revealed to you. But this uh, is where it starts. And, and one of the things that uh, really hit me when I heard that was that I live inside my pain body, and my pain body comes out, and people outside of myself, you know, my friends, my children, my spouse, they see and hear communication right. and actions and feelings that are being filtered through a pain body, sure. not being filtered through a present moment. And probably one of the most incredible things about a pain body is it seeks out other pain bodies. It doesn't seek out conscious light because it can't, it can't refer to that. So it has to latch itself on to another pain body. So, you know, that, that really goes without saying that we as a species think that every situation is the problem. We, the last place we look is inside ourselves to ask us, ourselves the questions of um, where did I start to believe this about me or what am I feeling right now, where did that come from, to, to start to really con deconstruct the thoughts that we have in our mind. We very quickly go to an external source and we make this our issue. And so the pain body is, it shows up to do that exactly. It's going to it's going to project and run to find the quickest thing it knows, which is another pain. So the unfortunate thing is that when we are projecting from our pain body, we actually don't get back the love that we really need or are looking for. We're getting more pain back. We're getting more reactivity back. Mm -hmm. And when you hear spiritual teachers or you hear spiritual leaders talk about this, all our work is on the inside, including the work of Jesus. He always said, that your work is on the inside, that God is within. All of this stuff is in your mind. It's in your head. Um, y yes, you look like you needed well, to say something. You, you talk about reactivity yeah. and, and reaction in through your pain body. Yes. Um, you know, that's one, that, that's another thing that I've noticed throughout. Um, and it, it kind of it really hit me when I heard it. Um, that is the reactions that I give my children and my spouse when I react. Right. I react through pain body and then, you know, I hurt them or I say something that I don't mean mm -hmm. or um and then I go back and I say, you know, I'm sorry, I won't do that again. Right. Um but how and, well are and, you on catching it the next time? Right. And that's one thing that Eckhart says very clearly is that you can say, you're, he'll, you know, he or she will say they're sorry and that they won't do it again. But because the pain, they're talking through their pain body, they're not talking them through them true selves. They're talking through their pain body. They will do it again and again and again. So, and right. Again. Let's talk about what... what makes the pain body so very difficult to break through. It's just like telling people, oh, your ego, oh, you just need to crush it or smash it or it's the enemy, you know, and you need to defend yourself against the ego. And what it really, when you go through the process of awakening and nobody gets to the end, not even Buddha who said he attained enlightenment got to the end until he died and he said, I no longer need this form I'm, I've transcended beyond it. So while we're in this human form, we have this leveling up in our consciousness to do. So what makes the pain body so tough and thick? Where, you, you know, and you really feel like this is a viscous thing that you can't break through. You know that you're reactive, not responsive, to different mechanisms. And that one thing that meditation really trains the mind to do is to slow down a second to be aware of the thoughts we have in our head. And if we're constantly bombarded with a pain body that's, let's just be honest, highly influenced by negativity and images mm -hmm. portrayed in entertainment, mm -hmm. in the news, social media, you get it. We're feeding the pain body constantly. Negativity, negativity, negativity. And, you know, and... It's making it bigger. This is a real... Absolutely. It becomes a form. Absolutely. This really becomes a form. One of those things that was shown to me that you recognize is that your thoughts will create your matter and then it spins it into this solid, tangible situation. 
So yes. I don't know if you I don't know if you caught it when he was talking about that, but why do we as a species seek out action movies that involve some sort of violence? violence. And that's the thing is I'm you know I love horror and horror is <laughs> what what am I trying? I'm trying to scare myself by entertaining and delighting my mind with all of the terrible, scary thoughts and monsters I have in my mind, which at this point I consider them fascinating. Um, but I still, what am I actually doing to my mind in this entertaining kind of space? Violence has a whole nother dimension to it. You can be scared and not react to harm someone else. Most people though, in violence, you'll feel it. Your heart starts to pump, you sweat, you feel this adrenaline rush, you suddenly want to turn the music up. You can see people that come out of a movie theater that have watched a movie that's very violent and they're they're jacked up. They're all like, nah. and- Why is that? Because of all things are what, energy. What, like what is, what, what courses through their body and what courses through their mind as they watch a a a action movie that involves violence. I'm a you know I, I love martial arts movies. Yeah. So yeah. when I watch martial arts movies, oh, great. You know, next thing you know I'm jumping up in my living room trying to do a flying flip mm. kick and. But, but martial arts has a you know, has morals and values attached to it. Right. Let's be real. When you're watching somebody assassinate someone, there's no morals and values in there except a projection of one's mind of what's right and wrong. The pain body loves to continue to feed this because we get to externalize the importance or lack of importance because nothing in there is is really what it seems to be. As he was talking, Eckhart Tolle was talking about the movie that it could be used in a way to actually authenticate the situation by showing people what certain behaviors had consequences, which you don't see in the movie. So it's a complete fantasy. People go in there with this, I need to feel more amazing and I need to feel more courageous. And the ego goes, well, violence is the way because, you know, you need to be able to protect yourself and defend yourself and stand up for yourself and be able to attack and all of this. And the soul goes, not necessary. You know, it's kind of like this hippie guy going, not necessary, man, right, you know, right. ride the wave, you know, and, and we can't, if we're highly reactive, you've got to come to a space where you can tell yourself the ego is doing all it can to stay functional only because it believes it's protecting me. Now, we live in a world where all reasons to protect oneself and defend oneself and be, you know, uh, even myself being a woman, I have people say, you need to know how to defend yourself against an attacker. And I have been raped before. I have been attacked before. And there's this part of me that's like, yeah, that is so important to know. And it's sad that it is. It's important to know how to disarm someone or be able to get out of someone's clutches fast enough where you can get to a safe space just for being a woman. But this, all this, all this violence, perpetuates it. It just makes this ego pain body stronger. And why? Because it's a high. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a temporary shock. Well, I, can, I can tell you as a woman for in a woman's perspective, the only way to get out of a person out of a man's clutches is to kick it right in the ball sack. It's if so you can <laughs> if you can reach it. And that's not always possible. I mean if you if you're with an attacker, they will defend their jewels. I'm gonna be completely honest with you. Oh, yeah. you know? Um, so, and I've had mace before and not been able to reach it. Okay, so there are instances where all of it, but as you're saying, we gravitate toward this because we're, we are born into a world beget of violence. Sin is all around you. What do I mean by sin? I mean, people are greedy. They're vain. They believe that love is lust. They don't take time to learn and love each other anymore. They're quick to hit first, ask questions later. And all of this is off the mark, which is what sin means to be off the mark. You're not, you're not even living life through love, the filter of love, let's say. Um, you're, you know, no, everybody lives their life through the filter of hate, anger. and So that's what you're exposed to. You know. And, so, and what, do you, what wolf do you feed? Frustration. Well, and, what kind of parents did you have? Right. 
So, you know, for you, however your situation was, and you've you've let me know a little bit, you know, you kind of felt like abandoned. So did I. My father left me when I was very young, so I felt abandoned. And then that was replaced by a man who was very violent. So I had a direct um, um, repulsion to, to violence because I was exposed to high levels of it that were extremely painful. Now... That pushed me away from violence, but other people, especially boys, are more prone to gravitate toward it because they're told to suppress their feelings and go and do something right. more physical right. and more violent to get their their well, aggressions out. Absolutely, you know. I mean, um, you know, I'm a sports buff. I, you know, I did the whole aggressive sport thing. I played football. I wrestled. You know, I, I did those things in, in, in school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I was a mixed martial artist. I was yeah. a cage fighter to take aggressions out of So all uh, that's contact. Like that. All of that's you know, contact. And, and were you a bully in school? No, I wasn't. No? I actually was not. I was, uh, you know, I was very lonely in school. I didn't have a lot of well, friends. Well, yeah. I got that um, too. I was very withdrawn. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, reflective, as, always trying to find your place, maybe. As, as far as like love Me. life, I didn't. <laughs> as far as like love life, I didn't have one. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. my current spouse right now and my love life, you can basically. I know it sounds really cliche, but you can count it on one hand. And a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, that one hand's used for." The, you no. Know, but, yeah. Well, you know, you can. be it be it I that have, you go through. You know, I have not had experience in relationships. Right. Well, so. well, let's 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 just, let's just be honest. Here, I'm going to stumble on my words because I've lived it. through my pain <laughs> body for most most of my life. You can have five relationships. You can have fifty. In all of them, you can say, "I'm not entirely sure how love works," because all fifty of those were failures. You feel, or all five of them were failures. So we can't even count on the measure of how many we could cycle through to figure out where the bottom falls out from underneath us when we're living through our pain body mind was PTSD you know and then living a totally dysfunctional relationships that I had were were totally lopsided and for me I was running all that through my pain body mm-hmm. now how how to wake up because you know a lot of people will say, well, this is all fine and good. I understand that my ego is playing games because it's been exposed to a tremendous amount of adversity. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's right. I mean, we are literally subjugated under a God who loves fear, violence, anger, torture, and likes to validate it and make promises of a, of a kingdom and a paradise to come. When we know, as Jesus had said, that, it, that the heavens live within you. And so if we need to find that, we have to go inside. Right. Now, it's going to beat you down. I have never known anyone who really woke up without a shock, a reality shock. And, and most of that comes with, like, Neil Donald Walsh, for example. I'll use him. He was in a car accident He lost his family. He lost his job. He was homeless for a year. That was his wake-up call. I mean, one minute he's got it, the next minute it's gone. And that is one way that it can happen. Another way is severe depression. A lot of people go, God, this is horrible. I'm so very depressed. The only element that they lack is a guide that can say, we're going to use this to move you through it. We're going to rebirth you out of this depression because you are depressed down into it by a frame of continuous thought. Now, you see, you seem very educated and you seem very knowledgeable about a lot of things. Just briefly, if you can make it brief, just briefly, how did you get out of your pain body into a life of where you live now? You know, I mean, because yep. I'm I'm obviously on that. I'm not, you know, for myself, I'm on that path myself. Yeah. And I'm trying to break away from my pain body and see my life through a different set of eyes, so mm-hmm. my family can see me mm-hmm. through a different set of Absolutely. eyes. Absolutely. So, how did you get away from your pain body? Um, life has to be unbearable. 
It absolutely cannot go on anymore the way it's going on. It has to reach an absolute pit, hit of the bottom. And when I look at myself, um, the loss of my son did that for me. Um, my partner was unable to grieve and took to what his male ego prompted him to do with everything. He went and he physically thought he could take that out and uh, you know physically purge it from him. It was an internal situation. And with the loss of that feeling abandoned and then the loss of my child, um, nothing made sense anymore. Uh, you cannot wake up just I think waking up without having some exposure to consciousness and I think that's because we have to know the alternative otherwise we're completely blind I don't think I would have known how to break out of that if I hadn't had one beautiful soul say to me have you ever heard of Eckhart Tolle and the power of now which I had not and would need that book I would need it to save my life after my son Sequoia passed and I need to pick up awareness or knowledge from another who was wiser than myself to guide me into a space where I nothing made sense anymore. So it's a welcome your sorrows, welcome your fears, welcome your doubts, welcome your pain. They're conduits to bursting through this heavy, horrible, let's be real, non-existent life where you just, you, you wake up and you drudge through your life wondering how to make sense of it. Um, and and I, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah. I wake up in the morning and I, I drudge. You know, I love doing my filmmaking. Um, you know, I, I love that aspect. Um, you know, my day-to-day -day job I, I really hate, but, you know, it pays the bills and brings in money, mm -hmm. so... You know, until my passion can bring in money. So the hardest you know, thing but, for us to do, or for you to do, is to be willing to literally change your mindset. Like catch, catch what you are saying to yourself throughout the day, and we get really accustomed to going off on this rhetoric every single day, and we're like, oh, no, I'm being positive, and we don't listen to half of what comes out of our mouth. And I'm not saying to pick yourself apart, I'm saying being the observer of your thought, which meditation will help tremendously with, is going to help you know that you're not your thoughts. And as long as you say to yourself every day, I go to my, my job and I hate my job, guess what it does? It feeds your pain body of, I hate my job. There's more negative. It will build it. So I'm going to quote Marissa Peer because she's one of those absolutely incredible hypnotherapists that I've, I love her work. I do her work. I highly recommend her work. Um, she's done a lot of stuff with celebrities and she has this great, powerful, amazing um, affirmation I use every day, which is, I am enough. And the thing is that for anyone who wants to wake up in consciousness, here's what you have to know. I'm going to have to leave it all behind. All those things I think that I am, that I think that I want to be, I need to discard these because I can't see who I really am under all of this other stuff of who I think that I am. You can't really see who you are through the pain body. Right. You also can't manifest. Let's be honest here. You cannot manifest positive object objection, object of oh God. Um, oh, this is beautiful. This is some good stuff. You can't um, positively gather what you really want or lay the foundation for what you want with a pain body that's only geared towards negativity. So when you're waking up, you're rewiring and recircuiting and nothing feels comfortable or right. In fact, you want to resist all of the efforts to go and do things when you don't really feel like it or, or other things that seem more pressing that are externalized because this is your ego going, don't do it, man. You blow the cap off. We won't know who we are. What are you going to do then? Well, you've barely got a grip on anything as it is now. Now your, your spiritual teacher your, your, you know, or your mentor or somebody is saying, hey, you're going to have to drop all the shit and find out who you are under this garbage that's been weighting you down which by the way is just all your past that you're lugging around mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. so what do you do I would say 
understand your mind, number one. That all demons inhabit your mind. So understanding your mind. Um, your thoughts. Your mind. Your behaviors. Your thoughts and behaviors. Understanding those. Mm -hmm. More or less <clears throat> what I'm gathering from, from our wonderful conversation here. Um, that understanding your thoughts and your mind will come through meditation. Is that correct? And meditation is a tool to change your gray matter. So right now, all thoughts are being filtered through a mind that knows ego is number one primary. When you sit to meditate, you calm down this amygdala reactive point, and you pretty much just give it like a zen bath. You like relax for a little bit. But what happens is all of these things from the day blow up in your head. I mean, how many times have I heard someone say, I sat down to try and meditate, and I just can't do it. It's too noisy. Yes, it is. It's supposed to be. Because we cap everything, we push it down. So what meditation does is it gives you the chance to sit down and learn how to observe the many thoughts that come to your mind in any given moment. Now what you're not doing is trying to sort the thoughts out or say I don't need to think at all. But you need to be aware of what is more negative, what is more positive, and what distracts you. Well, that's funny that you say that because I've done meditation myself. And yes, it is very noisy. You know, and... Every time I sit down to do meditation, it boggles my it boggles me because I can sit down and do meditation, everything will be quiet and calm, and next thing you know, the first thing that pops into my head is some form of random song. How do you deal with that? I mean, here's what you do. You know what I how love do you deal doing. With that? Um, and then I go into singing the song, and then now I'm not in meditation anymore. I, I love know. that. You know, um, this is the tactic, a great tactic for the ego. And here's what I have to say. This is what Master Charles once told me. He said, you have two, two options. <laughs> you can either just see it and say, you know, oh, we're just, we're just going to observe this. And, and continue singing the song. I, we'll turn up the volume on it and we'll join in and dance. What you're doing pretty much is saying, yes, yeah, so this song is going on. Isn't this great? Thank you. And as long as you just go into the presence and go, yes, yeah, the song is going on, something will happen. It'll go, mm -hmm. almost like something that no longer gets attention or something that's got enough attention and no longer needs any more. It just got mm -hmm. Yes, right on out. So, but once you invite it in, see what, what you're doing is, I resist you, don't do it, you shouldn't be here. And what I'm saying is in meditation, oh, there you are, funky song. Well, if we need to dance, let's turn the volume up. We'll do this for a while. I'm totally in the present moment with you. What else do you have? And all of a sudden it goes, poof, I have nothing. Because you've just taken the light and shown it right into the present moment. <laughs> and now you speak nothing. Now I have done meditation and I've had nothing, nothing. happen. Nothing. Now, what do you mean by nothing? There is a void. It's just absolutely nothing. Like, I've mastered meditation or something. There's like, there's no thoughts. There's no song. There's nothing. Mm. It's just so that's ego blind. Empty okay, space. that's ego blinding you, totally blanking you out. So here's what I want you to remember: the mind naturally thinks a million thoughts a second. Right. So if you're seeing nothing, the ego goes, <laughs> try this, okay. Nothing, I mean, you're not going to see a thing. I'm just going to blank it out. And I'm going to tell you, you're doing so good because you're so calm and nothing's gone on. In which case, it's like you're peeling the tape off of the cloth and going, oh, look at that nasty wound under there. You know, it's been hiding, pretending that it's not there. So in those instances, you want to dig. You want to ask yourself a question. What am I feeling right now? If you can't go through your thought, your feeling will be the next indicator of what's happening within your life. Then the ego will take that and run like crazy with it, watch out, right? And then you begin to be aware. Last night I had, I'll share this with you, kind of how these things go. Last night I had a dream, and it doesn't matter how long you've been in this, I don't think you can master it. That's the whole point. It's a journey that goes on indefinitely. You just get to figure how much you want to go into the stage of peace and enjoyment and balance and love and harmony in your life or how long you want to struggle with doing it this way. The Buddha came to a point where life was peaceful, but he would never tell you, hey, I don't have kinsho. Some stuff just sucks. There's days that just are unbearable because I live in this human form. 
and I can't transcend it until I die. I would have loved to have known what Buddha's pain body was like. Heavy and thick I in bet. the beginning because I they bet. they say and this I want to say guys, um, if you have a horribly thick pain body, this is a blessing. Some of the most incredible enlightened beings on this planet had the densest pain bodies. So think about that. They had to walk through hell's fire to get the the light of, of God, let's say. So this is a blessed thing. You know, I myself, I've gone through freaking horror, okay? And um, I know friends of mine that go, I just don't get it. And I have to tell them you are an old soul that has to come here and and go through this and know it because you're living in a world where you're going to need to identify and you can't do that without experience and so if the world is a mess the way it is now you need to be the recovered alcoholic you need to be the person who knows about uh, suicide prevention you need to be the person who knows how to help women with their guilt and their shame you need to be the person that can help people with domestic violence you see and you need to know it by having some experience in your life now do you have any experience in any of those in your life at all yeah i do I, everything that i do everything i do has come from my past experiences i use all of it and some of it's really darn hard to talk about some of it is is really wrapped me in my own shame of, of many years that uh, I have endured very hard abusive relationships and going I'm the most loving person I know I just got I had the most m messed up emotions in my PTSD and that's what I was projecting sure. I was finding that in another person I was going right for another person that went pain body understands abandonment and finding a guy who would do just that and that was a reality check see yeah. so so what do we do I have something that I I really love to do um, I have something called surrender meditation and it's very different now when I worked with master Charles Cannon he uh, came out with like this it's called um, modern high-tech um, meditation we call it the high-tech meditation and it's really like it's music that works with brain waves, so it literally lines up the brain wave frequencies in your brain for you. Now, why is this important? Because when people typically start to meditate, if you go out to China or Tibet, they start when they're five, four, or five years old. Guess how long they do it? For 30 frigging years before they can really get any significant, like, aha change. Why I was really blown away by this is that my teacher was saying, I don't want to go for 30 years. What could I do to shorten that time by a fraction, like a quarter? Like you could get 30 years of meditation in 10 years. That's incredible. That's incredible to even download that much in a mind that could be changed. And he was doing that through sound. And so... Well, sound is its own... It, sound is... Yeah. Sound has its own healing. Yeah, healing. Properties. So when you're when you're doing this, I say you know do this kind of meditation. It ampl it really accelerates the process of consciousness, and we need gas on here. We don't need gas on in faster cars. We need gas on in consciousness. We need to wake up the world. Okay, we don't need faster rockets. We don't need people that can hurt each other more or beat each other up bigger or whatever. We need more here in peace. We need more drawn in love. We need more drawn in equality. Okay, and so the surrender meditation was something that I did in, it was in a very difficult, painful part of my life, and I want to stress the fact that I did it in the middle of it. I didn't wait till time was perfect. I didn't wait till my situation was just where it should be. I didn't wait till I had time. I made it. Whether that time was five minutes at a time or it was 30 minutes at a time, I carved it out. And so that's the utmost importance. But the surrender meditation is broke down into four stages. And the first stage starts in awareness of just the fact that we don't know who we really are, right. okay? And that's the discovery. And there's the release of the negative. So you go into a deep theta, almost delta state, and you're going to be peeling away the negative thoughts, the negative beliefs you have in yourself, because this is what you run on every day. Believe it or not, your thoughts make your reality. So we need to change that up if you want to change your world. I ran into a woman today who, who looked at the word belief. She goes, yeah, you can believe it. I couldn't say anything to her because I knew her energy was like, <laughs> she's not going to hear the fact that you believe it first and it comes. 
believe it and then you see it because that's the truth. But she thought you see it and you believe it. She's still looking out her scope. So this is where I have to keep my silence a little bit. But our, as you go through the third one, it really, really amplifies this. We don't go any further than this in most meditations. And that's where um, we release the positive. That's the third stage. That's the third stage is you release the positive. Because we think, well, good, I'll be the happy, wonderful, beautiful, conscious person who's loving to my kids and a great partner. And we say that's also an identification. And when you want to get down to the source of who you are, we'll peel that away. So you might ask, oh, my God, well, who, what, what happens to you? Right. Do, don't I just disappear? <laughs> well, do you? I'm still sitting here. That's very true. So you don't. So what happens? What happens when you start to release the positive? It all goes away. And you come into this space where you realize you were none of that. All of it was created. And you have to let it go. Because all of it came from a source of unconsciousness, right down to the person you believe is a good person. Mm -hmm. To get down to the source of who you are, you have to dissolve all of it. So when I did this meditation, I got down to the void. And you hear that talked in ancient philosophy, void. the void. Yeah. And you get there where there's the nothing. Nothingness. There's no nothing. It doesn't feel dense anymore, though. It, it is a blackness and an emptiness full and pregnant with possibility. That's the difference. That's like the, that's like the starting point of creation. It is exactly that. The void. Exactly. And what you do... From that void, yes. you can create whatever you Exactly. Want. So here you are in the moment of your own light, right? Your light. And you go, now, pick up the paintbrush and the easel and the pastels and whew, go for it. Who do I want to be? Who do I wish to be? How do I want to be remembered in this world? What kind of lives do I want to impact? Who would I, what, what do I want to leave behind? And it becomes different. Your, even, your whole purpose for living is a purpose of service, which you hear in many ancient philosophies is the only will of the heart anyway, is to serve others. You don't have any other will in your passion to be happy except to feel the delight of another. Because your pain body doesn't know that one, but your soul does. So you want to make a soul connection with someone. That's why you wake up. So you no longer are coming to pain body to pain body. It's soul connections to one another. You know that love, and you're like, ah, and there it is. But the process to getting there is quite a leap for a lot of us. Sure. And, and it's quite a journey, quite a lot of hard work. Well, yeah, hard, well, hard no, work no, no, it is. It. Oh, God, let's just say it. Let's just say it. Your soul, yeah, your soul doesn't need effort. Your humanness does. Yeah. Your mind does. And it's people that I know are so discouraged that they're like, I've been on this path. Why is this stuff still going on? And I feel like all of the strain and why am I here? And, and we're, this is where we have to bond together. We have to just be there and support and go, this is a collective mental illness we're under. Yeah. You'll not be unscathed by it. It's not going to not brush its wings against you. You could be sitting here in this coffee shop like we are right now, going, all oh, is so good. And all of a sudden somebody walks in or something happens. You go, oh my God, I want to cry. Right. And you've been, right. you, the wings have been swept by you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because you're part of the ocean. You're part of the ocean. You're in it. And the only way to do this is to change it. And the thing is, when you light up, you light up like a million torches. So the ego has this interesting reference. You know, they're all like power and power play and manipulation because you need to control. And But you can't control the tides, right? right? right. You control yourself. Sure. But it has such a small density and energy. It's so far down the rung on the frequency that when you're, you're lit up, you know, even if you're dipping back down and forth and you're really, and you're really working that effort to maintain mm -hmm. the, the, the amount of miracles that are blessed upon you, the amount of luckiness that people say, the, the, the great health, the beautiful relationships that gravitate toward you, you don't have to search for them anymore. They come. And people go, what is it you've got? Positive thinking. <laughs> and you kind of do have to say it that cheesy because it's really true. I got positiveness. I've got it in my soul. Right. That's how I think every day I see the best in people. You know, so I hope this was helpful. And uh, we, I, I've enjoyed, I love these talks. I love these talks. And there's much more of them. And so I just want to make sure that people know how to reach 
more to do more here. I'm on Facebook. Uh, you on Facebook as well? I am on I'm working Facebook. on Facebook. Um, so uh, Bella Michaels under Facebook. I'm on Instagram as well. Same name. Trying to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I'm on YouTube also. And you can get any of this information on how to do these meditations. And it's all encompassed. I don't want anybody to believe it's a one-stop shop. Look, you're going to meditate. You're going to breathe. You're going to eat right. You're going to think different. You're going to love different. And that includes how you have sex with people. <laughs> That's one of the problems I got is eating right. <laughs> you know, it, it's all in there. It is all in there. And right. consciousness, it, it, it just sponges away the things that, that aren't working in your favor, in your soul's favor. Just to remember... You came here to do something amazing, mm -hmm. to be your ultimate awesomeness, <laughs> okay? That's and, a good one. I like that. And, and you, to be your, your ultimate, ultimate awesomeness. awesomeness. And, and you cannot do that while you're miserable. So the only thing to do now is to wake up the world, my dears. That's it. And it's a heart at a time, a soul at a time. Well, I want to say, um, you know, uh, thank you very much Heck for yeah. having a conversation and, and bringing me upon this conversation and uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to <laughs> you, you too, everybody, and everybody, Merry Christmas yes. and Happy New Year to everybody Yay! else. Yay! So, 2022 is the most rocking year coming around, guys. We are like... Make sure you make your New Year's resolutions and hopefully the New Year's resolutions will be a little bit <laughs> wake different up, after is we, to wake up. After you <laughs> you won't need another resolution if you wake up. <laughs> You won't. Right. <laughs> okay. So, guys, uh, let's connect on Facebook. Let's connect on Instagram and YouTube. Let's keep the lines open. Um, always, always give me, you know, questions. I love to hear from everybody, and I really hope that I hope that this was helpful. I love how I just stumble on my words, and we just keep rolling along. <laughs> That's what you do in these times of day. That's what you do in these times. Yeah. You just keep rolling. All right. All right. It was wonderful to meet you guys, and uh, until next time, peace, love. And be you. That's right. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>